God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, good morning, church. We are thankful to be in the house of prayer once again. We look forward to hearing a needful word from our God. We want to share a thought with you this morning, and our assignment will be taken from the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version, beginning at verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. I want to speak this morning from the subject, calling on the wrong fire. Calling on the wrong fire. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, is a very interesting chapter. It records several significant events. In Luke chapter 9, we see him empowering and sending out the 12 apostles. It's in this chapter that we read of that famous miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. In this chapter, we find Peter's confession, acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. And Luke 9 tells us of the mountain of transfiguration, where Jesus reveals his glory to Peter, James, and John. It also tells us of the healing of the demonic boy, an event that always follows the mountain of transfiguration in all three synoptic gospels. And it's in Luke 9 that Jesus makes an announcement of his crucifixion. Actually, a second announcement of his coming crucifixion. And it ends with him setting a journey to Jerusalem. In this chapter, what I find striking is it reveals the behaviors and the comments of his disciples. Now we can see from these chains of events that this chapter covers a period of time. This isn't a two-day event. It covers several weeks maybe a couple of months. And Luke, when noting these events, he marks 
the responses of his apostles. And some of them are quite astounding. Some of them may even be quite shocking. What I believe the Bible is showing us is how we respond to the things that Jesus does. So in the beginning of that chapter, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. So here he gave them power. Now power to do what? And power for what? Power over demons. Power to cure diseases. Power to preach. Power to heal. So his intention in empowering the apostles was to help people. That's why he gave them these gifts. That's why he gives us gifts. They're not for ourselves. They're to help others. When we go on, and the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. Now this takes us to that event of the feeding of the 5,000. So they come back from a successful mission of doing many miracles and healings. And a multitude of people are so impressed with Jesus and his followers, they follow him into a desert place. And now he has a large crowd before him. In fact, the largest crowd that we would see in the ministry of Jesus next to that Palm Sunday. Well, what were these apostles' response to this? When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into surrounding towns and countries and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. So their response is, it's time for these folks to go home. There's too many of them, and they're needy. What are we supposed to do with them? Jesus, this is a good time to call a benediction and just let them go away. Jesus responds, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. Jesus' response was, let's take care of them. The apostles' response was, this is a hassle for us. We don't have time for this. We don't have enough resources for this. Send them away. And of course, we have one of the most miraculous miracles in Jesus' day. It then goes to that other famous story of the mountain of transfiguration. Here, Jesus takes the three closest to him, Peter, James, and John. They get up there and they behold Jesus in his glory, along with the appearance of Moses 
and Elijah. Well, what was their response to this event? Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Peter's response was, this is really cool. Let's set up tabernacles. The tabernacle now was tents. The Israelites lived in tents for 40 years in the wilderness. So Peter says, let's set up three tents. One for you, Moses, and Elijah. Why is he saying this? I don't want to leave here. This is some good stuff. Why don't we just stay? And it will be me and you and Moses and Elijah. And we could just have church all week long. We don't have to go down to all those people down there. We don't have to mess with anybody else. It can just be all about us. Some folks come to church with that kind of attitude. I'm preaching hard now. It's all about us. Let's just have a good time, me and Jesus, where I don't have to worry, I don't have to think about anybody outside here. They come down from that mountain and they come across a father with a demonic son. And we all know this story. The man says, so I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Well, why could they not? In the first verse of the same chapter, he says he gave them power and authority over all demons. Then Jesus answered and said, oh, you faithless and perverse generation, how long? Shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. We read in other accounts of this story, he makes it clear. You couldn't do it because of your lack of faith. He calls them faithless. He calls them perverse. And he makes that statement, how long must I put up with you? It challenges us to the question, is God just putting up with us? Can he use us freely? Are we open to his spirit and movement? Or is he just putting up with us? He heals the boy. The story goes on. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. And while everyone marveled, at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about, is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Here, Jesus tells them in no uncertain terms, I'm about to be betrayed. Now, keep in mind that enemies don't betray you. People you trust betray you. And he says, I'm about to be betrayed. I'm about to be handed over to men who are going to torture me and kill me. Well, what is the apostles' response to this? The very next verse, then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. It's astounding. This chapter is clearly full of the followers of Jesus falling short. 
and behaving and responding in contrary ways to the things that God is trying to do. And that brings us to our text where perhaps one of the most astounding responses of the apostles. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and as they went they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. James, an apostle of passion, and John, who would be called an apostle of love, sees this and says, Lord, do you want us to kill him? Just say the word and we'll take him out. And they have Bible for it. They're quoting an Old Testament occurrence. They're quoting and referring to Elijah, the prophet of fire, in 2 Kings, the first chapter, where Elijah is tormented and threatened by a small army from the king. And he was empowered and called fire down on this army. So that's what they're referring to. That's what they're looking for justification for. Now, it brings us to the subject of Samaritans. Well, who were they? and What were they all about? Israel at this time, the time of Jesus, is divided into three regions. The north is Galilee, where Nazareth is, and where Jesus and the apostles lived. The south is Judea, where Jerusalem and the temple is. In between them is the land of Samaria. There was a hostility and animosity between Jews and Samaritans. And it's a feud and animosity that stems back hundreds of years. It goes back to the Old Testament times when Israel was a divided kingdom with 10 tribes to the north and two tribes into the south, that kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. In the year 732 BC, the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom. He took them into exile and captivity, very much like the Babylonian captivity. And the way this was accomplished was they took all of the influential people, the kings, the priests, the prophets, the rich people, and exported them and dispersed them amongst all the pagan nations in the surrounding areas. But it didn't stop there because then they would take some of those people from those pagan nations and import them into this land. So now this part of the region has become polluted and diluted. And the end result of that were Samaritans. But the Samaritans were a people that attempted to cling to and claim the God of Israel. So they were a mixed race of people, but yet they wanted to be servants of Yahweh. 
and considered themselves servants of Yahweh. But Jews had no regard for them because they saw them as impure, wannabe Jews. And so there was a constant hostility that lingered for years. Jews hated Samaritans, and Samaritans hated Jews. Samaritans weren't allowed in Jerusalem and certainly was not allowed in the temple. We see this hostility when Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The Pharisees, in their constant tension with Jesus, at one point called him a Samaritan. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Jesus, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? One of the worst things you could do to a Jew is call him a Samaritan. So now the Samaritans have a part of land and the hostility was so rich that when the Jews traveled from north to south, it is said that they did everything they could to avoid a direct line to Jerusalem. That they would go the long route along the Jordan River to avoid having to go through the Samaritan villages. Here, but the Samaritans did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. So now understand what's happening here. Jews preferred not to travel through Samaria. We'll take the long road if we could avoid it. Here in this instance, the Samaritans locked out the Jews. The Jews, Jesus and his disciples wanted to get to Jerusalem. The Samaritans said, you know what? Go the other way. We don't want you walking through our towns. And the apostles, namely James and John, just couldn't understand it. The irony here is the Samaritans are doing to them what they always did to the Samaritans. It reminds me of a scene. Like Paulie, he just can't understand why they might possibly have hatred, the same hatred that he has for them. In that famous parable of the Good Samaritan, the question is raised, who is my neighbor? Or another way of saying it is, who exactly am I supposed to love? Who do I have to love? And who don't I have to love? So who's my neighbor? And it goes to a comment that Jesus made regarding the law. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor 
and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. They're quoting a scripture, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Now, the scripture that they're quoting comes from Leviticus. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, if you haven't noticed, the problem here is that this verse is not saying anything about hating anybody. So they're misquoting the scriptures. It's not what it says. It says you to love your neighbor. It doesn't say anything about hating anybody. So where did they get that from? Well, it says right there, you have heard it. You have heard that it was said. Somebody told you this. You didn't read it. You took somebody's twisted interpretation of what this scripture is saying. Well, what then is the difference between a neighbor and an enemy? I'm supposed to love my neighbors. What's an enemy then? How do I differentiate between a neighbor and an enemy? The difference between a neighbor and an enemy comes down to your perception of who they are. It's how you perceive them that makes them your enemy. It's how you look at certain people, certain groups, and we all do this. You know how we operate. We have us, and then we have those people. Those people that bring trouble. Who are those people that we don't want to tolerate? Those people that we hope never come into our church. Those people that stir something up in us that causes that emotion that says they're not like us. We don't want to have to deal with those people. We don't want to have to love those people. And like James and John, we find Bible verses that make it okay to have negative feelings about those people. We have Bible verses that justify and allow us and excuse us of hating certain people. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Jesus, you know the Bible talks about this. And it says it's okay in situations like this, to respond with a little bit of vengeance, a little bit of anger. It's something that we all need to confront because we know how to put on that good face when we come amongst our own. We know how we're supposed to look, how we're supposed to act, what we're supposed to say that would seem to reflect our Christianity. But too often, there's someone else behind that mask. 
where if we search ourselves, we would have to admit there's a little bit of that James and John in all of us. Because there's just certain people that we don't want to have to put up with. We don't want to have to tolerate. And we feel justified by doing it. If what you believe produces unkindness and intolerance, then something's wrong. If you believe your Bible is excusing the way you think and feel about people you don't like, there's a problem there. John speaks of this. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, it's a little ironic that John addresses his audience as beloved. You wouldn't think he would have to say you ought to love one another. But beloved, if God loved us, we ought to love one another. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Read it again. Jesus speaking, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Love others the same way that I loved you. We all know the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. A demeaning task reserved for slaves and servants. You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. Now you would think that the next verse would be, then you ought to wash mine, which would be an honor. But that's not what he asked for. You also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus says, not only are you to love, you're to love the way I loved you. Christians who love like Jesus look like Jesus. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? God loved us while we were his enemies. He loved us while we were sinners. God loved us when we were like some of those people. Well, James and John couldn't understand this. And they wanted to call fire down on those people. He wanted judgment. He wanted God to remove those people, send down fire. It would recall us to the words of John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And we know from the stories that sometime later, 
when Jesus will get up from the grave and send his spirit, that they were all in one place on one accord and a fire from heaven did fall and the fire that fell on these apostles changed their lives. It was this fire that fell on me one day and it changed the way I thought. It changed my thinking. It changed my heart. When the Holy Ghost fire hits you, it will do something to your soul and do something to your heart. When the Holy Ghost fire hits you, it will make you forgive people that you thought you could never forgive. When the Holy Ghost fire hits you, it would make you love people that you never thought you would love. It would make you pray for those who have hurt you. It will make you bless those who have cut you down. When you have God's fire burning on the inside, it will carry you through the most difficult situations. And when you find those people that you struggle with, those people that you find hard to forgive, those people that stir up those negative thoughts inside you just like it happens to all of us but the word of God would burn in your heart like a fire shut up in your bones and it will make you love them anyway it would make you pray for them Lord send down the fire send the fire down let it burn in my heart let it burn in my mind let it burn in my soul send down the fire Break after brick, God is building his temple. Break after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can.